Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar covering the vaporization of medicinal cannabis. I'm Paul Mayer, the Australasian Chief Operating Officer of Health House International. And tonight uh, we're going to be covering um, the growth of vaporized medicinal cannabis in the Australian market over the last two years. It's been astounding and it's gone from nothing to almost uh, up to 40% of all prescriptions in a very short period of time. Quite exciting, Australia is now exporting a significant amount of uh, GMP cannabis, primarily to Europe, where it's highly sought after. I'm proud to introduce the speakers tonight. First up is Dr. Jim Connell, who discussed when vaporisation is the preferred option and some background to its, certain, oh, its use in certain medical conditions. We have a patient advocate and prominent Australian comedian and presenter, Will Anderson, who will be detailing his experience with chronic pain. Last but not, not least, we've got Dr. Maddie Moore. He'll be presenting case studies on three patients he has treated. At the end of the session, we have Q&A. If you do have any questions throughout the webinar or uh, during the Q&A itself, please use the Q&A function at the bottom, not the chat function, and we'll get to as many questions as we possibly can. Now, all the information presented tonight is purely for educational purposes, designed for health professionals. If you do have any specific questions about your own medical condition, please be sure to contact your trained medical professional. So please sit back and relax, and let's kick things off tonight with Dr. Jim. Hi, my name is Dr. Jim Connell. I'm a GP and the Chief Medical Officer of Heyday Clinic. And today I'm here to talk to you about vaporizing cannabis. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to uh, Health House for having me and for my other colleagues um, who are presenting here tonight also. So first off, before we talk about the indications of use of um, inhaled cannabis, I think it's important to talk about what is a vaporizer. So a vaporizer is a device that has a controlled heating element um, inside a chamber with a, with a mouse, mouthpiece for inhalation. So what happens within this chamber is that the plant material is heated up to a precise temperature to allow the, the oils to um, evaporate, form a vapor and be inhaled. So instead of being burnt under pyrolysis and forming smoke, you are getting a, a vapor from those oils being heated to their um, preferred sort of temperatures. These can be battery operated, making them portable, um, or they can be plugged in as a desktop device um, as well. There's a couple of different types of vaporizers. So the, uh, the highest quality vaporizers are convection vaporizers where hot air is passed through that chamber. So you get even heating and even activation of the cannabinoids through the whole entire plant material. But other sort of cheaper and often more portable um, options can be a conduction option where the flower closest to the heating element is heated first and is slightly higher so the temperatures and patients may need to stir this plant material to make sure that it's all heated through um, properly. So a couple of, uh, these, are, these are the two registered vaporizers on the market. These are both convection options and is hence why they're more expensive and often a bit bulkier than some of their unregistered counterparts, but they do give a much higher quality experience. They're a lot more efficient. They're a lot uh, easier to get uh, precise dosing. Um, you get a better vapor cloud when using these types of devices as well. Here's just a couple of examples of the unregistered devices, which some of them can be applied for through the SASB sort of portal. But as you can see, they're much smaller, much more discreet. Um, but don't give the same um, type of experience that you might be after when uh, looking at using these for medical purposes. So when choosing a vaporizer, look, the quality of the vaporizer is crucial, not just from the experience, but also because cheap vaporizers are often made with poor materials, which means that certain toxins or chemicals may actually leach into your medicine and get into your lungs, which is something we're obviously trying to avoid. So often when people hear vaporization, they think of vape pens and, and, and a barley. So when we're talking about vaporization, we are talking about vaporization of whole flower products. So whole flower cannabis, nothing that's been extracted and then mixed in with a solvent like a vape juice or an e-liquid. So those solvents that they use 
um, are things like propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin, which can potentially um, have harmful byproducts when they are heated. But the highest concern and, and, the, consult and the causes for concern with the barley uh, are other additives that have been put in with those products. They're often from illegal um, products uh, for recreational sort of users. So vitamin E acetate being indicated in causing a barley, things like certain terpenes like squalene and phytol, which aren't in nat naturally in the cannabis plant, but um, when they're heated, they're unstable and they break down for, from these sort of uh, dangerous sort of metabolites. And then also the fats themselves. So fats getting into your lungs is not going to be a good thing. And this can lead to things like exogenous lipoid pneumonia. And so you might get questions from your patients about whether they can put their oral oils into their vaporizer. And the answer is a hard no. You do not want to be inhaling MCT oils. So in these sort of concentrated sort of products as well and unregulated markets, the plant itself has often been grown in an environment where it might be contaminated with, with mold, heavy metals, toxins, pesticides, and these all get sort of concentrated in there. And look, this can happen with black market cannabis as well and whole flower products. And so that's why it's so important to use medical grade products because they've gone through the regular checks and balances to make sure that what the person is inhaling is not contaminated with things that can potentially cause issues with their health. With these vape pens as well, things that are generally recognised as safe are only generally recognised as safe when ingested sort of orally. So this does not transfer to things that are inhaled. So, you know, often these things um, have been, you know, people believe that they're safe, but they, depending on how you use them, they may not be safe after that. And with those vape pens as well, they often have poor heating elements. And instead of actually causing a real vapour, they can often cause combustion and smoke, which is potentially damaging and harmful in itself. So whole flower vaporization versus smoking. Look, smoking is still around the world the, um, the most accessible and widely used way of inhaling cannabis. And so I think it's important that we discuss is whole flower vaporization superior to, to smoking? And the answer is yes, mainly because you get a reduction in bronchial irritation and inflammation when using a vaporizer. You're also minimizing or, or negating the potential harmful toxins that come with that smoke. So the poly polyaromatic hydrocarbons are and other harmful chemicals. With a vaporizer, you also get to preserve a lot of the medicine that you're trying to actually get as well. So some of those volatile compounds like terpenes, when you burn them, they are incinerated and don't actually get into the system. So you're losing the entourage effect there. And you often will lose a lot of the cannabinoids as well. So about 30% of cannabinoids go up in smoke. So you're literally wasting medicine as you wash those things to burn. Then also with a vaporizer, you'll find that the, the, it is a lot more precise as well. So you can set the temperature to activate specific compounds. You can um, elicit multiple therapy benefits and experiences by activating the, the, the same material at different temperatures as well. This allows for more deliberate and precise dosing. And there's less temptation as well to use more than you need. So when you when someone's passing around a joint, that burning ember on the top is often a temptation to have more than they actually need to achieve the results that they're, they're looking for. So with a vaporizer, you can turn it on, you can turn it off, you can take a couple of inhalations, you can wait and then, and then repeat the process. So look, is inhaling cannabis bad for your lungs? Look, all smoke is bad for your lungs. And this comes, if this is the same, if it comes from the fireplace, from gas cookers, you know, cannabis only smoke has been shown to cause some chronic bronchitis, increased mucus production, and therefore increase uh, risk of pneumonia. However, cannabis smoke alone doesn't seem to cause uh, lung cancer, and it hasn't been shown to cause COPD as well. So the damage that is caused is generally reversible upon cessation. And with a vaporizer, vaporizers are going to be healthy unless you're using a poor quality vaporizer or a contaminated product, or if you are someone that has very reactive airways and that irritation can cause some bronchospasm. Are there positives of inhaling cannabis? And, and the, the, potentially, yes, um, but a lot of these positives can you can get as well from having the medicine orally. So THC is a bronchodilator by uh, activating the CB1 receptors. There's anti-inflammatory effects from the cannabinoids as well as some of the terpenes. There's antibacterial effects, there's anti 
fungal effects, and it can help regulate DNA as well, so reducing the risk of cancer formation. And one retrospective study that has recently been, been done looking at a lot of hospitalised COPD patients has shown that those COPD, COPD patients that also used cannabis actually had a um, lower mortality rate in hospital and they had a shorter duration of stay within the hospital. So there does seem to be some protective elements there. And so we're looking at what are the benefits of using the inhaled route? So why would I use inhaled cannabis over these oral formulations? The main thing being its speed of onset. So when you use an oral formulation or a sublingual formulation, look, it takes one to two hours before it starts having an effect and doesn't peak until about three or four hours. With inhaled cannabis, it starts working within minutes and you'll have that peak, peak effect within 20 to 40 minutes. It does wear off um, faster as, as well. So generally out of the system or no significant activity after about four hours, which can be beneficial. You can get instant feedback with inhaled cannabis as well. So with oral formulations, if you take a dose and then you find that it's suboptimal, you need to wait 12 hours or so before you take the next, next dose with inhaled cannabis because of that more instantaneous feedback. You can take a couple of inhalations, you can wait 15 minutes, you can then see how you're going and take another couple of inhalations. So within a session, you can often find a therapeutic dose rather than having to do it over multiple days. When using inhaled cannabis, you can have quite a high bioavailability. Um, that depends on your te technique, but you have quite erratic absorption with or oral ingestion or sublingual ingestion. And, and the you know, amount that you absorb is probably only going to be up to about 14%, whereas with inhaled cannabis, that can be up around 60%. You also get higher concentrations within the blood, which can lead to stronger effects. So when you have severe symptoms, inhaled cannabis can be a great way to get on top of them quickly. You're also going to avoid any gastrointestinal upset. So some people really struggle with, with oils or if they already have, or if they have gastrointestinal upset and they're vomiting, you know, they're not going to have proper absorption of, of those oils. So bypassing the gastrointestinal system is going to be really beneficial um, in making sure that they actually get the medicine into their system. And you're also, you know, bypassing that first class metabolism and enhancing the bioavailability there. So what are the negatives? You know, so that shorter duration, so it makes it less appropriate for chronic symptoms. Those high concentrations that you're getting in the blood, they can increase the risk of adverse effects and make it so you have a higher likelihood of develop, developing tolerance, especially if you're only using inhaled cannabis as your only form of um, medicating with cannabis. Because of that instant feedback, you're also activating those reward pathways within the body, which can lead to increased risks of dependence. And because you're going through the lungs, there is that, you know, is the potential for bronchial sort of irritation. And if you're susceptible, leading to bronchospasm and respiratory distress. So when do we use inhaled cannabis? So look, there are a lot of different conditions will respond to inhaled cannabis, but it's more around the pattern of the symptoms is what's going to determine whether inhaled cannabis is a, an appropriate adjunct to your treatment. So if someone has episodic symptoms, so they only occur every now and then, then using inhaled cannabis is, is appropriate. If they have breakthrough symptoms, so most patients will have a background level of pain, a background level of stress, but depending on what is going on in that particular day, the environmental sort of factors that are, that are occurring, they may have a flare of their symptoms. So inhaled cannabis is a great way to get on top of that you know, increase in symptom burden quickly without necessarily needing to change the, the level of your background sort of medications. You know, if someone has that you know, GI upset, then using the inhaled route bypasses that. If they have that severe nausea and vomiting, once again, you're reducing the chance of erratic absorption with the sort of oral or sublingual routes. And then because of that high bioavailability, if someone has severe symptoms as well, the inhaled route can be really beneficial. So I'm often using it for breakthrough pain, breakthrough anxiety, sleep initiation, nausea and vomiting, migraines, especially to abort a migraine. So when you use inhaled cannabis, if you can use inhaled cannabis right at the start of a migraine, so as they're getting the aura, it can be quite a good treatment in stopping those migraines from happening. Saying that though, if you get the timing wrong with that migraine and you use inhaled cannabis, it can increase the intensity of the pain as well. And then things like Parkinsonian tremors, uh, our colleagues over, over in, in 
the States where they've been using cannabis for a long period of time, have found that inhaled THC is the best for actually helping with a lot of these motor symptoms. And so if a patient has a particular task that they're wanting to do and they're being obstructed because of their, their uh, the tremors causing disability, you might use some inhaled cannabis to allow them to achieve that task. It's not something you would be wanting to use all the time to treat tremors, but you do it on a task, um, you know, when there's specific tasks that sort of uh, need better fine motor control. And then same with MS um, spasticity as well. The studies have shown that you have a stronger patient and practitioner reported reduction in spasticity when using inhaled cannabis over the oral forms as well. So a way that I use cannabis generally is in a, in a layered approach. And I think of the inhaled cannabis as the instant release medicines, the, the tinctures or capsules as a slow release sort of medicine. And I'm often using them in combination with each other. So they don't need to be mutually exclusive or, or used alone. They often work best together. And you're also going to mitigate some of the potential risk for abuse if, you, if you're doing it that way. So we have to be aware that inhaled THC does increase the likelihood of dependence and misuse. So we need to have clear and deliberate intentions with our use. We need to know why we're using it and we need to have a plan in what is that patient going to do once they achieve symptomatic relief. So if someone is in distress, they have pain and what they're trying to do is block that pain out and they just, you know, using as much cannabis as they can to get rid of whatever that symptomatic burden is, then that can lead to problematic use. But if we say you've got stress and we're going to try and alleviate that stress to a point where you can then go and engage in another health promoting activity, like doing some meditation or going for a walk or connecting with family, you're looking for a different functional um, level and intoxication is going to sort of impair them from doing that activity. So they're just using enough to get, you know, relief of the symptoms without blocking everything out and incapacitating themselves. You also need to provide good education around diminishing returns with increasing dose. So the more cannabis you use, especially with THC, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have better effects. Yeah, there's actually a, a, a sort of bell-shaped dose response curve with, with THC where once you go past a certain point, you actually get reduced, um, reduced symptomatic relief. You want to be using you know, how cannabis with slow release preparations when, when appropriate for people with chronic, chronic sort of symptoms, and that's going to re reduce the amount of cannabinoids they have in a 24 hour period, which, is, which will make it less likely to develop tolerance. Um, you want to discuss tolerance breaks with your patients as well. So if the patient is using, needing to use more and more to get the same results with inhaled cannabis, then it's a clear indication that they're building tolerance to THC. And a good thing is to do is a 48 hour holiday from all THC preparations. And this will allow their body to reset. You also want to choose your patients wisely. So don't use in adolescents except in extreme circumstances and obviously precautions in under 25 because this age group has a much higher propensity for developing dependence and, and addiction potential. And you want to make patients have a healthy relationship with cannabis. So you want to be looking at people's past, past use, making sure that they've had no sort of drug and alcohol sort of issues in the past or a particularly addictive personality. So choosing the right product is important. And a lot of it is around those functional goals, not necessarily disease orientated, but what is the pattern of symptoms that a patient is experiencing? And your functional needs vary dramatically be it morning, you know, afternoon or nighttime. So in the morning, you want, you're looking for a lot less intoxication. You're looking for the capacity to be able to switch on and maintain focus. So you might be using inhaled cannabis that has more CBD in it. So looking at a, at a balanced profile or a CBD um, flower, or if you are using THC because the severity of the symptoms dictates it, you want an uplifting terpene profile. And the terpenes are the aromatic compounds that often dictate the mood of the medicine. So things with limonene, alpha pinene, terpenylene, eucalyptal can all give people um, an energy boost, which is needed in the morning. Now, in the afternoon, you're looking at more sort of balanced strains. So that people still need to function, um, but they are wanting to relax and unwind after a difficult day. So you might start looking at things that have a bit, bit of extra linalol or a bit of caryophyllene, which is good for, good for pain relief. Um, and then at night time, you know, the, the number one thing that you're trying to achieve at night time is a good night's sleep. And so looking at 
more THC predominant products because this is better at reducing ruminating thoughts or um, displacing uh, distressing sort of memories and, and promoting sort of positive memories. And also you're wanting to have a sedating profile so that it helps them shut down, unwind and get off to sleep. So I hope that helps you um, navigate this, uh, this interesting area of medicine. Here's just a couple of graphs on oral versus inhaled plasma concentration. So as you can see, you get that much faster onset with inhaled cannabis, much faster offset and those higher peak concentrations as well. And then also looking at the difference of the terpenes, they have different boiling points depending on how volatile they are. So setting that temperature in the vaporizer at lower levels and working your way up, you can experience all of the different elements that the, the cannabis plant that you're using um, has to offer. I hope that helps. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm here with Australian comedian and presenter, Will Anderson. Hi, Will. Oh, hi, Paul. Thank you for having me. Um, now, I understand even though you make many Australians laugh on a regular basis, you suffer from debilitating chronic pain. Can you describe it? Yeah, I can. Uh, when I was about 32 years old, I uh, had a series of misdiagnoses because uh, what I have is osteoarthritis in both of my hips, and it was pretty young for somebody to present with osteoarthritis in both their hips. So I was seeing back doctors and leg doctors and all sorts of things for the related pain that I was getting until somebody actually said, let's get some x-rays and work out what's really going on here. And it turns out that I had uh, very degenerative hips, um, you know, basically a, a lifetime of having, a, you know, a genetic condition plus playing a lot of AFL football and kicking my leg up and down when I was young. It meant that my hip sockets had worn away severely. So basically it was bone on bone in both of my hips. And so 32 was pretty young to be considering full operations on both of the hips, particularly with the technology that was available for hip operations 15 years ago, as opposed to the ways that it's advanced in those 15 years. So every doctor that I saw recommended to me that it had to be firstly, you know, medication and lifestyle changes to try to deal with the pain before we could get in a position to know whether we had to operate or not. Because at the time I was in such severe pain that I was on a whole range of over, um, sorry, prescribed uh, painkillers, um, you know, that really weren't even barely touching the edges when it came to my, my daily pain and certainly weren't something that I could live my normal life while taking. So in that time period, probably the year later or the year after that, um, I moved to America to work. I used to spend six months of my year in the US working over there, touring all over America. And that was about the time when medicinal cannabis was starting to come on the scene in the US, obviously in a very different way to how it has come on the scene in Australia. But um, I was based out of LA and in LA, you could go and get yourself a medicinal cannabis card. It wasn't particularly difficult and there wasn't a lot of follow-up questions from you doctor about you know what you were then going off to to buy or to access but it was halfway towards having a doctor's program around my pain so for the next 10 years or so while I was living there it was a series of you know I guess you know legal experiments where I tried to work out myself what would work for me you know in the daytime and the nighttime in regards to using cannabis for my pain but it was only really when I came back to Australia that I consulted, you know, obviously with the, with the advances here in Australia that happened during that time. I consulted with the doctor about what my options were. Because for me, the biggest thing of all is like having some sort of medication that I can use on a daily basis that it still enables me to be able to go about my life and do my job and that I don't build up enormous, uh, you know, with some of the, you know, prescription medications, they, they would be fine for the first you know, month or two in, in regards to pain relief. But obviously, you know, the more you use them, the less relief you'll be getting from the pain. And obviously the more damage that you felt like you were doing your body taking these hardcore pain medications. So it was only really when I was back in Australia and I finally got a proper consultation from a doctor who was invested in not only just giving me a card and getting me out of the office and cashing their check, but somebody who was invested in the idea of let's put together a program that will be good for you across a day, across a week, something that you can integrate into your lifestyle in a meaningful way, but also might have a meaningful impact on the, the pain that you suffer. So that's that's a very quick version of my 
15 year story. Mm. And um, have you tried oils and vaporized cannabis and how do they compare? So my initial, uh, so we're talking about the Australian experience yep. now because in America, like, you know, obviously everything was available, you know, edibles, oils, whatever you might want, you know, was available over there. But let's talk about what my experience has been here in Australia. And so it's been about 18 months now, I guess, that like time means nothing anymore in these COVID times. You could tell me it was 18 months or 18 years, but I'm going to have a guess it's been about 18 months. And what uh, my experience has been is we started with a combination of flour and oils. That was, uh, you know, what we started out with. I unfortunately, when it comes to oils, find them a little problematic on my stomach. It can be a little risky for me to, you know, I just have a, I mean, nothing more than a grumbly tummy, but, you know, there's just parts of your day when you don't want to be out and about with a grumbly tummy. It always feels like a ticking time bomb that you're never sure what the results might be. So I've always found that the, the flour and vaping, which is the, the way that I consume the flour is vaping, um, seems to be. A, the best method for me that I've settled into, and I probably use the oils very occasionally and, and sporadically now rather than on a daily basis. Yeah, and if you could describe the pain level on a scale of one to 10 before using medical cannabis and, and what relief you have achieved? So I, I, need to, so I need to put this in context a little just for the sake of clarity, I think, which is that two years ago, I was probably in the worst pain that I'd ever been in. You know, and I'm talking, you know, daily nine, nine, nine or 10 out of 10 pain. You know, you, at the point where I was like, you know, getting maybe 40 minutes of sleep and then having to get up and, you know, walk slowly through the house to stretch out to, you know, get to the point where I could go back to bed and get another 40 minutes of sleep. And that was, you know, with a combination of, you know, cannabis at the time that, that was not medicinally prescribed. I was taking prescription drugs, um, you know, so many. And, you know, at that point, when you're in that sort of pain with, you know, the x-rays that I have, the doctors will just prescribe you essentially whatever you want to take. That, you know, if you went into their office and you asked for whatever sort of painkiller, they will just write you a script for it. And I've always been very aware of just because it's there does not mean that you should be taking it. So, but at this time, my pain was absolutely terrible. Now, obviously, COVID happened. And for me, that meant a few lifestyle changes, which meant I wasn't traveling as much. I wasn't sleeping in unfamiliar beds. I wasn't spending as much of my time on planes and in cars. So I need to set that agenda that there were some lifestyle changes that were also made in this time. I can't ascribe all of this to, you know, the magic of medicinal cannabis, but I will say that also during that time, having a regulated medicinal cannabis program that I could talk to my doctor about and make changes to, has meant that, and it's hard for me to say, you know, chronic pain sufferers will understand this because they know what it's like to live with chronic pain. My, my three is probably somebody else's six still, but I would say on a daily basis, it's a two or a three compared to what I would have said it was a nine or a 10 when I started 18 months ago. So for me, it's surpassed to the nth degree the benefits I was expecting to get from it. I have been blown away from seeing the difference between essentially being handed, you know, a medicinal cannabis card and then being left to my own devices in my US experience versus working with a doctor who would make adjustments, who would take into account what it was that I needed from my day, you know, my capacity to be able to still perform my work, do my tasks, these sort of things, you know, how we could balance those things, you know, with a, with a program that would work for my every day. I've never slept better. I mean, that's the, the greatest thing for me, you know, with the pain that I have in my hips, people who experience that sort of pain will know that even if you take a, a you know, a painkiller from the doctor in you know, a pill form, often what happens is you might get five or six hours of sleep, but the painkiller wears off and then, you know, you wake up in extreme pain and that's your sleeping done for the rest of the night, or you have to take another painkiller that's going to then knock you out for another sort of, you know, five or six hours. So being able to, you know, regulate that to be able to use the flower through the bait form if I just needed to top it up a little more in pain, you know, in a pain sense and go back to bed and get more sleep. That's been the absolute, you know, miracle for me. You know, I'm probably averaging seven hours of sleep a night, which I wouldn't have done in a decade, which is incredible. And then I've found that the more that I use, the, the, like more that I've been regular in my program, the less that I've used. You know, I've gone from being a really regular during the day, meeting to for pain reasons, 
sort of top up to, you know, sometimes going whole day is really where, like the first time that I might use the flower in the bait form would be five or six o'clock at night rather than having to use it in the day at all. So I am one of those people that, Again, I like to put the perspective that there's been a bunch of other lifestyle changes in the meantime. I stopped drinking alcohol completely, which as people know, for you know things where you have inflammation can be incredibly helpful. So there has been other things that I've done in conjunction with this. But part of the reason I was able to quit alcohol pretty much completely in that time as well was that I had something else that was regulating and helping my pain. So yeah, it's been a really fantastic story for me. I can't overstate how helpful it has been. That's not only good feedback for medicinal cannabis, but also the Australian medical system. So, <laughs> during, um, any side effects? Well, I mean, the only side effect for me was from the oil. So, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, like I had, you know, I, and when I and again, I don't even really want to overstate it. You know, the sort of side effect you might have from a, you know, a too strong coffee that you have in the morning as well. But, uh, but for me, that was probably, you know, annoying enough that it meant that that wasn't something that I would use as regularly as I would like to, as if, if, you know, if I could find an option that didn't have that same effect for me, because there are obviously some situations where the vape just isn't as practical as being able to, to use an oil in that situation. But other than that, with the vape, I've found um, it incredibly easy to use. And I mean, without wanting to dob myself in for, you know, unhealthy you know, practices beforehand, it's also enabled me to give up smoking completely. So like give up smoking cigarettes completely because obviously that was previously something that, you know, tobacco was part of my life, you know, as people would know from an unregulated cannabis supply a lot of the time, those two things go hand in hand. So having access to something that was actually doing the job that I was paying for has enabled me to also, you know, cut that out of my life. So it's had, you know, incredible health benefits just sort of on a, you know, in a related sense, you know, by able to be a cutout sort of the amount of alcohol I was drinking and sort of the tobacco that was in my systems as well. So no negative side effects from the vaping, only really from, from the oil. Yep, excellent. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your story with us. I really appreciate it. My, my pleasure. Thanks, many. Thanks, Paul, Jim, Danya. I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you about a few cases where flour has been instrumental in relief of my patient's symptoms. Sorry. I'm Maddie Moore, GP in Dunsborough, co-founder and chief medical officer of Mode Healthcare. And I've been an authorized prescriber for two years now. And during this time, I've had some great results with certain appropriate situations with medicinal cannabis flower. So flower, as you've likely heard already this evening, has a much quicker onset of action. that opens up a whole different therapeutic option for your patients. Instead of waiting for the GI and eventual liver metabolism for one to three hours with ingested products like oils, gummies, or capsules, your patients may benefit from symptom relief in five to 10 minutes with inhalation. For several indications, this may be ideal, including palliative care, cancer-related pain or symptom management like CIMV, acute panic, resistant anxiety, and PTSD. Some of the man management of these are demonstrated in a few cases that I'll be discussing with you tonight. So the first of which is an indication for chronic pain. A gentleman with the initials RI is a 42-year-old male with long-standing abdominal pain due to complications from multiple surgeries for ruptured colonic diverticular disease. These complications include adhesions and hernias, which along with chronic sustained pain presents with intermittent significant acute pain that was not only relieved by conventional therapies over the years, but also non-conventional therapies such as cannabis oil. But due to multiple herniographies, RI's pain continued to escalate despite increasing doses of conventional medications. When introduced, cannabis oil did, however, bring his pain scale down from a nine out of 10 most days to five out of 10. But unfortunately, when he, was, when he had acute severe abdominal pain, this was not enough. Therefore, flour was introduced. Of course, we started low at doses of 0 0.1 grams and titrated to effect. Maximum doses of THC were 30 milligrams in 24 hours, divided between his cannabis oil and flour. Pain levels further decreased to 2 out of 10, and opiates were discontinued. 
He had had greatly improved quality of life and improved me. Furthermore, he went back to work and is currently employed. So what this case demonstrates that for chronic pain, cannabis oil may not be enough and cannabis flower is a viable option. My second case is for the indication of PTSD and a 47 year old veteran of the war in Afghanistan. DP had multiple tours, was in a bad way, in and out of hospital and not contributing to society in any meaningful way. He was suicidal and none of the conventional therapies prescribed by his DVA and medical team were working. They were causing dependence, too much sedation and contributing to his poor quality of life. He then accessed black market cannabis and found the relief he found the relief that he was missing for so many years. DP had been trying to access cannabis legitimately for several years before I met him. However, he kept getting knocked back from his providers that he had queried. With the support of his psychiatrist, I started him on a balanced full, full, full spectrum oil with great success. Instead of putting himself out there to get in trouble purchasing cannabis on the black market, he was now getting sustained pain relief from a cannabis oil. However, despite this treatment, he was still getting hypervigilance during the day and still was having nightmares that greatly affected his sleep patterns. Therefore, an indica flower was introduced for both times of the day, one for acute treatment of his triggers during the day and another with higher THC and a sedating terpene profile for nighttime. DP is now in a stable relationship and has a much better quality of life. This case demonstrates that flower forms of cannabis and more specifically anandamide and CB1 receptor activation can help patients with fear extinction with positive results in alleviating baseline anxiety, panic attacks, and sleep disturbance associated with trauma-related nightmares. My third and final case is for the indication of CINB in cancer-related pain, and EL, a 35-year-old female with stage four colon cancer. Treatments were hectic for EL. Her lesions were widespread, which caused significant pain. Her treatments were leaving her unable to eat, and most days, her nausea was unbearable. Furthermore, her anxiety about the situation was severe, which caused a significant sleep disturbance. High THC oil was started with success for her baseline pain. This was titrated up to 30 to 40 milligrams per day. After approval from the WA State Health Department to use up to 60 milligrams of THC per day, she was started on a flower regimen. She slowly introduced flower treatment for her acute pain, nausea, and anorexia due to chemotherapy. This was moderately successful, but she was still unable to sleep despite using a reputable indica strain. I then changed her indica to something with a better terpene profile for sedation. The second strain had a higher percentage of mercine, beta carophylline, and linalool, and by gosh, it worked. Each system is different, and for one person, a certain profile may work, but in another, that same profile may not be effective. This case helps demonstrate not only successful flower use in a late-stage oncology patient, but it also allows me to talk about terpene profiles. When in doubt, change it up. Be bold and ask questions. One of my mentors in medical school told me something I'll never forget. Five minutes of reading turns a chump into a champ. You're obviously bold, that's why you're here accessing medicinal cannabis for your patients. But there is heaps we can learn about minor cannabinoids and terpenes that change the whole therapeutic effect of one plant or cultivar versus another. In this case, yes, she had terpenes that ordinarily were good for sedating effect. However, just by choosing another strain higher in each of these pushed her over the edge, so to speak, somehow and allowed her to get sleep that she needed. Thanks guys, I hope that what you've seen tonight and I've shared briefly has been helpful. If there are any questions that you have, get in touch. I can be reached on email at maddie at modehealthcare.com.au or have a look at my website, www.mattmoremd.com. Or you can look at my socials on Instagram with my tag at Dr. Maddie Moore. Thanks so much. Happy prescribing.